joy I own When brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken No, I won't be shaken My fear doesn't stand the chance when I stand in Good morning, Compass Christian Church. How are you all? All right, so good to see you all. Welcome back for those who are back and welcome for those who are new. Uh, my name is Paula and I'm the worship pastor here at Compass. We are continuing our kingdom series. I think we're at Sermon 10, 10 of 12. That's a big deal for us. We are a new church, so this is our first sermon series and um, number 10 is a big deal for us. We're pumped, so this one is on peace, kingdom peace. Pastor Will will be sharing on that very soon. Um, like Amanda said, we've got a great kids program and soon they'll be dismissed, but let's enjoy this next song here. Cause you know 
say your word, you're a good, good father. It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect. As you call me, deeper still as you call me, deeper still as you call me, deeper still into love, love, you're a good, good father, it's who you are, it's who you are. together for my future and for 
When I doubt it, Lord, remind me I'm wonderful in it. You're an artist and a potter. I'm the canvas and the clay. I know nothing has been wasted. No failure or mistake. You're an artist and a potter. I'm the canvas and the clay. You make all things work together for my future and for my good. You make all things work together for your glory. up here and other elders come on up. We're going to do something a little bit different before we get into our sermon. Um, in the Hebrew Bible, in the Old Testament, elders were um, people who stood at the gates and of the city or town. And uh, <laughs> Jason, you can come over here if you'd like. Elders would sit at the gate and they would offer uh, advice or legal feedback on whatever was going on in the town or the city. Uh, in the New Testament, in the post-Pentecost church, elders were, uh, Paul exhorted elders to be ordained in every city. He told that to Timothy and to Titus. And the, the reason for the elders were to uh, oversee, to oversee the, the local congregations, to be spiritually responsible for them. So in modern times, uh, churches often have elders. And so we wanted to announce that this is your starting group of elders for Compass Christian Church. So here we are. Um, Paul and I get in on the fact that we're pastors, and pastors in the New Testament and elders are very related offices. Uh, but we have four other elders up here. So um, my exhortation is, uh, if you have any questions, talk to any of them besides me, okay? I'm trying to abdicate some responsibility here. Uh, but no, we're very excited, and we're so thankful for all of your service, uh, your dedication, and, and also, you know, the clear, uh, if you look at Timothy and Titus, the clear description of what an elder is supposed to be spiritually, these people all exemplify that, so we're so thankful to have them serving in our church, so thank you all very much. Thanks. Happy to serve along with you. All right, well, we are in our 10th uh, sermon in the Kingdom series. We're only a couple weeks away from Easter now, and we're in our last a topical sermon. So we've been doing six different ways the Kingdom of God gets described throughout Scripture. Uh, we talked about Kingdom power. We talked about uh, Kingdom love. We talked about Kingdom justice and Kingdom righteousness. We talked about, um, oh man, what was last week again? Kingdom mercy. That's right, Kingdom mercy. Now we're on Kingdom peace. So we're closing, we're closing this out here, and what we've seen throughout this whole series is that uh, the kingdom of God is in its fullness when Jesus Christ comes back, and he sets up that kingdom on earth with a restored earth and uh, with a restored heavens. And so uh, while we can experience uh, part of these things in the present, the fullness of it's still to come. For example, we saw uh, we can experience so much about love today, uh, but the love as it's going to be expressed in all of eternity, it's just on a different scale. It's, on a different, it's just a different thing. It's a different magnitude. Uh, when we think about righteousness, we can walk a righteous life today. We can live righteously today. We've been declared righteous. We can live a righteous life. But when is sin going to be finally conquered for once and for all? In the kingdom, in the future. And so the fullness of that righteousness still comes in the future. Uh, justice, you know, we can seek justice now. We can go to Wayside Christian Mission. We can help 
uh, with the people there. We can alleviate uh, their suffering, their pain. We can help them some. But when is perfect justice going to be worldwide in the future? Right. So we're going to be talking about peace this morning. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Numbers chapter 6. So what we've been doing throughout this series, we've talked about the, the bad news related to whatever topic we're talking about. We talk about the ultimate good news and then the good news for today. So what is the bad news with respect to peace? So, you know, peace is, I think, multifaceted, multi-layered. And so um, today we're going to be talking about three different aspects of peace. And actually, there's going to be a bonus one, but I didn't want to put up here yet because I don't want to spoil the surprise. Uh, the first one is the state of being in right relationship with God. So that's a kind of peace that we can experience. Um, the another one is the absence of war, which I think war, you know, war and peace are often seen as opposites, right? But um, we can also sort of enlarge that to being in right relationship with mankind, with, with humanity. And then the third aspect of peace is really the one that we think about, I think, the most in our day-to-day -day lives. And we could define it as like the internal state of being undisturbed, you know, not having, it's like the absence of anxiety. It's almost like uh, the absence of bad emotions is what we sort of consider peace to be internally. It's sort of interesting. Now, we've also been going through the Hebrew words for all of the words we've been looking at as we've been going through the series. And today, I don't even have to look at Anna. I don't have to look over there. <laughs> Don't even have to ask her. This is one that we all know. The Hebrew word for peace is the word shalom. Say it with me. Shalom. shalom. Peace be unto you as well. Thank you very much. Um, so this idea of shalom is actually bigger than what we generally think of as peace. You know, we have a very sort of like limited uh, idea of what peace is. But in the Hebrew, uh, it means completeness, soundness, welfare, and then also peace. So there is this idea of uh, like peace from war, like the absence of strife or the absence of war. Uh, but there's also this deeper layer of uh, friendship or relationship with God, uh, friendship or relationship and wholeness with others, uh, as well as like completeness and soundness in our whole lives, health, prosperity. There's sort of a lot of different layers uh, to this word shalom. So the bad news with respect to peace is we didn't always have it in any sense with God. Uh, since the fall of humanity, man has been at war with God. And so we were not in a state of peace or wholeness or friendship. Uh, one of the really cool things about the story of the Bible, though, is, is that God had an ultimate plan to bring peace between God, between himself and, and, and us. Uh, but he didn't wait for that to start reaching out to humanity and try to restore that relationship however he could through the story of the what we call the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. And so one, one way that God did this, where he sought peace with humanity, was in calling Abraham, calling that man out of that culture, a pagan culture, pagan gods, uh, into a relationship with him and started giving him, he gave him a covenant, he gave him uh, different things to do. Um, and then that ultimately led to the nation of Israel. And then, of course, when the nation started growing and started getting more and more populated, uh, then God entered into a covenant with Moses. And, and uh, so here in the book of Numbers, what we find is that God was continuously trying to amplify this peace that he was seeking with these people, even though the ultimate peace he knew was going to come through his Messiah. So in Numbers chapter 6, verse 22, this is called Aaron's blessing. Uh, it says, The Lord, or Yahweh, spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his son, saying, Thus you shall bless the people of Israel. You shall say to them, verse 24, Yahweh bless you and keep you. Yahweh make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. Yahweh lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Verse 27, so shall they put my name upon the people of Israel and I will bless them. So here God is extending himself. We saw last week how he extended himself to us through his mercy. But he extends himself offering peace to his people as well. Not just through Christ, but throughout the entire story of the Hebrew Bible. Uh, one commentary that I looked at said that this lifting up his countenance in verse 26 was akin to God smiling upon his people. And so the picture we have here is of God smiling over his people. He's extending to them completeness. He's extending to them peace, health, and security 
through his blessing here. Now, of course, we know that the most complete way that he extended peace uh, to humanity was through the Lord Jesus. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah 53. We're going to find a section here that's called uh, the suffering servant. It's a description of uh, Jesus, really. I mean, but they didn't know it when Isaiah wrote it. They didn't know what his name was going to be. Uh, or what exactly this would look like, exactly how this would be fulfilled. But this is a picture for us of how God extended uh, Christ to us as a form of peace. This is a prophecy about that. In Isaiah 53, verse 1, it says, Who has believed what he has heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord, or Yahweh, been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. And this is a, I mean, this is a description of the crucifixion. Verse 4, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. Verse 5 is the key one here. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have, eat, we have turned every one to his own way, and Yahweh has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So Christ came to solve the problem that Adam started. And that's really what uh, Paul unpacks for us in the book of Romans, among other things. We're going to get to Romans here in a second. Uh, but I want to point out verse 5. Uh, there, are there are four things mentioned here. There are four things mentioned here. And there's something that we have to understand about the Hebrew uh, poetry and prophecy. And that is that there's this idea of parallelism. There's this idea of parallelism. And so what they frequently did throughout... Uh, the Hebrew Bible is that they, they layered things, and usually they were in couplets, but sometimes they come in fours, like we see here, where essentially the same thing is being said four times, or the same thing is being said two times, and it's worded two different ways to sort of bring out multiple perspectives or multiple angles. So I want to reread verse 5 for you. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our what? Iniquities. Those are completely synonymous. We all agree with that, right? Okay. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. In the book of Isaiah, frequently the word for healing that's used here is used of spiritual healing of the nation of Israel. They were seeking for spiritual healing. Now, I'm not saying that physical healing isn't a part of it in some further down sense, okay? But the primary sense of this is he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, and then these two other things, I believe, are essentially synonymous as well. Upon him was a chastisement that brought us peace. Peace with who? God. So what kind of healing was that? That healing was the separation between us and God, between the nation of Israel here and God. And we come into that through Christ as well. So this is all talking primarily spiritually. And again, I'm not saying that the physical, there isn't some downstream implications of that physically. I'm just pointing out that this peace is between us and God. That healing is of that relationship between us and God. So what is the ultimate good news? Uh, let's turn to Romans chapter 5. Like I said, Romans, if you want to talk about peace with God, you want to understand how it happened, that's the book of Romans. That's what it's talking about in large part. We're just going to pick a couple of verses out here. He's just spent a long time talking about Abraham how Abraham was made just. He's explaining how we're going to be made just uh, through Christ. And um, in Romans chapter 5, we see here that Jesus fulfilled that role of the suffering servant and he completed that peace. Romans 5 verse 1, it says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have what? Peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So what I love about this is we've got a lot of things going on here. We've got justification by faith, which we talked about like three or four weeks ago, about righteousness, how we were declared righteous by God, how we live righteous lives as a result, how we see the fulfillment of that in the fullness in the kingdom when sin is completely done away with. Um, but now we have peace. We have that restored relationship with God 
through Jesus, and through him we've also obtained access by faith into the grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So it talks even at the end of this about the kingdom, about how the kingdom is going to come, and we're going to see the fullness of that uh, glory, the fullness of that peace. Now, when we think about the ultimate good news, I think it's important to also mention that there are kingdom prophecies. We've already seen them in the series. Uh, Isaiah 2 is probably the greatest example of where um, the future kingdom is a place where the weapons of war will no longer be needed. And so they're turned into farming implements. That's what Isaiah 2 says. People will not even learn war anymore in the future kingdom. So the future good news isn't just that we have this relationship with God restored, but it's also that there will be no war. (laughs) There will be no war. And man, talk about times like today, you know, I really wish that were true today. So what's the good news for today? Before we get to our main text, I want to take a little digression to Zechariah. If you want to join me, you can. If you want to just look at the screen, you can too. I know Zechariah is not the easiest book to find. Um, But the... uh, We're going to get to a a section that we're all very uh, comfortable with, very familiar with. Um, I sort of stumbled across this Zechariah section. Honestly, uh, life as a pastor is sometimes interesting. You do word studies, and sometimes, you know, word studies are very helpful for, like, the general things that you're thinking about. Sometimes a verse comes up, and you're like, huh, I wonder what that word means in this context. It just catches your attention. And that's what happened with this verse here in Zechariah 6. So what's going on here in Zechariah 6 is there's, um, there's a prophecy that we're going to read, and the prophecy probably got fulfilled in the time of Zechariah. Okay, on some level, there was probably a pretty immediate fulfillment of this. Uh, but Zechariah also uses a title, the branch. We're going to read about the branch. We've already read about the branch earlier in the series in Jeremiah 23. And the branch is another messianic title for Jesus. And so here Zechariah is going to mention the branch, and he's sort of going to give that title to someone in his time frame. But I think we're going to see that the implications of it go forward. Um, And so what we're going to see here is we're going to see the branch. Well, I'll just read it. We'll just read it here, and then I'll talk about it a little bit more. Um, Zechariah 6, verse 12. And it says, And say to him, Thus says Yahweh of hosts, Behold the man whose name is the branch, for he shall branch out from his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord, the temple of Yahweh. Okay, that's interesting. It is he who shall build the temple of the Lord, or Yahweh, and shall bear royal honor, and shall sit and rule on his throne, and there shall be a priest on his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. So I found this verse because I was looking at peace, right? And I sort of stumbled into this, not like wondering, like, what is going on here in Zechariah? So it's describing the situation again, which was uh, probably fulfilled in that period of time where they were trying to rebuild the temple of the Lord. It had been broken down during, the, um, during different exiles and different things. It had been broken down and it needed to be physically rebuilt. It's talking about the physical temple. And what it's saying here is, is that there's going to be this, uh, this leader, sort of like a kingly leader, and then there's going to be this priest. And the king and the priest are going to be on the same page, and they're both going to be doing the things of Yahweh. They're both going to be doing the things of God. Now, if you understand the history of the Old Testament, Uh, How frequently did you have both a good king and a good priest at the same time? (laughs) Not very frequently. In fact, you could probably argue that, like, the worst case scenario, bad king, bad priest, that probably was, like, the majority of the time, right? And so sometimes you had a good king and a bad priest, or a good priest and a bad king. Like, sometimes you had it sort of mismatched. And so what it's saying here in Zechariah, what's sort of phenomenal about this prophecy is that there's going to be this king, he's going to be good. There's going to be this priest, he's going to be good. There's going to be a council of peace between them. But now notice what the activity is that they're doing. They're building the temple of the Lord. Now, who's called the branch? Jesus. Who builds the temple of the Lord? Jesus. Let's go read it in Ephesians 2. This is so exciting. I'm a, I'm a theology nut. I know I'm, I'm, but I just like, I'd never seen this in Zechariah before. I mean, I'd read it before, but I'd never like understood how this connection could be made. And again, this is a passage we've heard many times before. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Circumcision by hands, in other words. It's not the circumcision God cares about anymore, by the way. Verse 12, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ. 
separated, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is what? He's our peace, who has made us both Jew and Gentile, both one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in the place of two, so making what? Peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached what? Peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, you're no longer foreigners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into what? A holy temple in the Lord. In him you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So you think about the peace that Christ brought and how diverse it is, how multifaceted it is. First, in the context here in Ephesians chapter 2, it says that he broke down the barrier between Jews and Gentiles. He broke down the barrier between uh, who were in the covenant of God formerly in the Old Testament time and who could be now brought into a covenant with God through Christ that made peace between the nations. And if everyone would come into Christianity and really understood what that meant to follow Jesus, then we would experience the absence of war and strife today. It's just not going to happen. We just know it's not going to happen until Jesus Christ comes back. So now the people of God are one new man. That's the first way he brought peace. The second way it talks about here in Ephesians 2 is that Christ broke down the barrier and ended the war between humanity and God. So now we've got peace among the nations. We've got peace vertically as well between humanity and God. And now all people are called into a peaceful, friendly relationship with God. We can experience the wholeness and the goodness of God by being his sons and daughters. And now notice here, too, that the language is multi-layered. Uh, it talks about no longer being strangers, no longer being foreigners. Now we're part of uh, God's nation. We're no longer outside of the nation. We're inside the nation. And not only that, uh, we're not uh, strangers from a household perspective. We're not like people who knock on the door, oh, I don't know who you are. Now we're part of the family of God. So that, that's, there's sort of multiple layers to how the language is used here. So now we have peace with God. We've got peace amongst each other. And the third way that he brought peace is by building the temple. And so what's the only thing that's better than having a good king who works alongside a good priest? How about having a perfect priestly king? <laughs> One guy, two offices. <laughs> and that's who Jesus is. Jesus is, uh, he's a prophet, he is the high priest, and he is our king. He's all three of those things. And so I think that's a pretty surprising fulfillment of Zechariah 6, don't you? And here we see it here in Ephesians 2. I think it's really cool. Um, and so we can be thankful today that we are being built into that dwelling place through the Spirit, that we have the Spirit of the Lord dwelling within us so we can experience that peace. And so Talking about how the Spirit brings us peace leads me to our last aspect of peace, the peace that we tend to think more about in our lives, and that is how to live uh, lives that are undisturbed. We can turn to Philippians chapter 4. The last aspect of peace I want to talk about today is this mental state of calm or the internal state of being undisturbed, uh, internal peace. And we should... We should experience uh, that internal peace because we have that peace with God. We have that peace uh, with other Christians. Um, but the world is a complicated place, isn't it? And we still do have an enemy. And, um, you know, that's not going to end until the kingdom comes. Um, so let's, let's look at Philippians chapter 4. And we're going to talk about uh, what God can grant us through the Spirit. Verse uh, 5 here. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. 
Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So notice here that uh, the Bible in Philippians pits anxiety up against peace. And I think that's a pretty, pretty good biblical theme. And what Paul does here is, he imitates his Lord Jesus, just as Jesus encouraged his disciples in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6 to trust in God and to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. He did that in the context of anxiety. Paul teaches us to do the same thing. When we come into a situation that causes us anxiety, when we come into something that calls us distress, our action, our response to that should be to seek God. In the world, there's a lot of things people do to try to seek peace. People go to drugs, people go to alcohol, people go to the games on their phone or playing video games or, or talking to other people or whatever the case might be. There's a number of outs that people can try to do to get peace. And what the Bible is telling us is that abiding peace comes when we go to God in those times of anxiety. And what I love about reading verse 5 here, which I frequently didn't pair with this, uh, what Gordon Fee pointed out to me is, is that uh, this whole thing comes from the awareness that the Lord is at hand. That's the end of verse 5. Uh, I want to read a longer quote by Gordon Fee about Philippians 4.7. Fee says, quote, In a post-Christian, post-modern world which has generally lost its bearings because it has generally abandoned its God, such spirituality is very often the key to effective evangelism. In a world where fear is a much greater reality than joy, our privilege is to live out the gospel of true shalom, wholeness in every sense of that word, and to point others to its source. We can do that because, quote, the Lord is near, end quote, in, the first, in this first sense by the Spirit who turns our present circumstances into joy and peace and who prompts our prayer and thanksgiving. And we should be at that task with greater concern than many of us are because, quote, the Lord is near, end quote, in the eschatological sense as well. And that's what Fee says. And that esch eschatological just means end times. He's saying we should be reaching out to people with wholeness and peace because the end is near, because the Lord is going to be coming soon. I thought that was a great point by Fee. I think another great point we can make here is, is that it says in everything by prayer and supplication, uh, we, don't, we don't have to be thankful for everything. <laughs> we don't have to be thankful for all the things that we deal with. But I want to point out something because uh, I think that sometimes people talk about anxiety and they talk about, oh, look, like here's the remedy. It's just, you know, hey, go pray about it, you know. Um, and I think we get too cavalier with this sometimes. Um, and so I want to point out that this is not an automatic process. Uh, God does not expect prayer to be like an easy button. We're like, you know, something happens in our lives, and oh, I just go press the easy button, and immediately I just get like overwhelmed with this like supernatural feeling of peace. Uh, that's not how it works. Um, for those of us who struggle with anxiety, what this is saying is prayer is helpful. Seeking God is the way to go. That's what this is saying. It's not saying if you do this, it's immediately going to happen, and you're going to be immediately like flooded with perfect peace. Um, the, the whole context of the Bible leading up to these verses talks about a God who's with us when we experience trouble. Not a God that immediately always takes that trouble away. And so those who are struggling with anxiety, God is there with you in your anxiety. So I don't want you to condemn yourself or to feel like, if you're going through a troubling spot in your life and you do seek God in prayer and the result isn't immediate overwhelming peace, that you're doing something wrong, I want you to feel like God is with you in your struggle. God is with you in your anxiety. I also want to point out that some of the strongest, wisest, uh, best, by pretty much any metric, Christians that I know struggle with anxiety from time to time. Some of the best Christians I know. And what I know that they know is that God is with them even when they have their anxiety. God is with them. They seek God in that moment. And just like the Jews learned in the time of the exile that God was with them even in exile, so too we can see that even in our anxiety, even in our weakness, 
God is there with us. And I want to prove that. Let's go to Psalm 18. If you want to understand uh, where God comes in these moments and how he acts in these moments, the Psalms are a great place to look. And I just want to point out, we're going to read two Psalms of David. Uh, you know, David had periods of ups and downs in his life, uh, and these Psalms are often a reflection of that. And I just want to point out that David faced incredible uh, opposition, incredible uh, temptation to be anxious for years of his life before he became king. Years of his life where he was on the run, hiding in caves, hiding with foreign kings. And so when we read these words, I think it's incumbent upon us to not just think of this as like all happening immediately, because that's not what happened. It's not what happened. It took time for these things to develop. It took time for God to act in response to him. And I would encourage you to read all of, of Psalm 18. We're just going to read the first six verses. But if you want to read the whole thing, it's really powerful. Because the end of it, like a lot of it, is like what God does and how God does move. And he does move. God does move. I'm not saying God doesn't move. What I'm saying is it isn't always immediate. That's all I'm saying. Psalm 18 it says, uh, I love the, the top part here. It says, To the choir master, a psalm of David, the servant of the Lord, who addressed the words of the song to the Lord on the day when the Lord rescued him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. So this is on the day. He wrote this down on the day that he got delivered, right? Does that mean that this is all the stuff that he did the day that he was delivered? No, he's been doing this stuff for years. He's been praying this prayer for years. <laughs> Verse 1, I love you, O Yahweh, my strength. This is his confession. Yahweh is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God, my rock in whom I take refuge. My shield and the horn of my salvation. My stronghold. I called up upon Yahweh who is worthy to be praised. And I am saved from my enemies. The cords of death encompassed me. The torrents of destruction assailed me. The cords of Sheol, the grave, entangled me. The snares of death confronted me. In my what? Distress. I called upon Yahweh. To my God I cried for help. From his temple he heard my voice, and my cry to him reached his ears. For years David prayed this. And on the day that he got delivered, he could write it down and see this confession come full circle in his life. These are things he said. He said, God was his strength, his rock, fortress, deliverer, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield, the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. That's what Philippians 4 is talking about. Going to God like that. It's in our distress, in our anxiety, where we can cry out to God for help. And we can trust that he will not only be with us and comfort us in our distress, but that he will ultimately give us peace. He will ultimately give us peace. He's with us in our weakness. He's with us in our tribulation. Another example of this is Psalm 4. We're going to read the first and last verses. Again, you want to read the whole thing. It's wonderful. In Psalm 4, verse 1, it says, To the choir master with stringed instruments, a psalm of David. He says, Answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. You have given me relief when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. Again, there's time involved here. If he's saying, Answer me when I call, there must have been times when he called and he didn't immediately feel that the answer came. That's how he felt, and he's telling God that. But in verse 8, by the time he gets to verse 8, he lays out this stuff before God. And at the end, he says, in what? Peace. I will both lie down and sleep for you alone, O Yahweh, make me dwell in safety. So again, God gets there. He gets God's peace, but it's not, he has to wrestle with this stuff. He has to deal with it. I want to give you an example from my life. I don't want to tell the whole story, but those of you who know, know the full story. But uh, Becca had to have an emergency surgery about four years ago. And um, she was sort of in an emergency situation where she had to immediately go into neurosurgery. Um, and it was like, there's no warning signs leading up to it. It was just like, boom, immediate, like just happened. Like we were, everything was fine, then boom, something happened. Um, and so what I want to point out, I want to contrast my feelings during that period of time versus her feelings during that period of time. <laughs> All right? So now she's literally in and out of consciousness. She's you know, you know, going into surgery where she was completely out of consciousness. Um, and then I'm completely conscious the whole time. Yay for me, right? Like, that's great. 
Uh, so I didn't know if she was going to live or die. I'm just being honest with you. Like, I didn't know if she was going to live or die. Uh, it was not a very good prognosis. Like I said, sudden onset. Woke up that morning, everything was fine, then boom, something happens. Um, and so I'm going to be honest with you. When I was uh, trying to pray, I don't even know if I could really call what I was doing prayer uh, during that period of time. Um, I didn't have peace. I didn't. And I asked God to forgive me for that. And then he did give me peace that even though I couldn't really pray that uh, he was with me. But I couldn't concentrate. I couldn't, I couldn't really stay focused on it until she was fine. Uh, once she got fine, it's sort of funny. Uh, she comes out of surgery. I come going to talk to the doctor. And uh, he, the first words out of his mouth aren't like, your wife's going to be okay. Uh, he was like, oh, look at this slide. Look at that slide. I was like, what are you, like, dude, tell me if my wife's going to be okay or not. Like, <laughs> sort of weird, honestly. Surgeons, man, I tell you. Um, <laughs> So, but anyway, like, once I got to see her and, like, talk to her later that day, like, I was fine. And, like, I was, like, it was probably, like, the best prayer warrior 72 hours. Because the guy told me, like, you have 72 hours. She gets out of that. She's probably going to be pretty fine. Uh, and she was. She was fine. She got through the 72 hours. But for that, like, 72 hours, like, I just prayed, like, whole time. I asked her about it later, and she said, um, coming in and out of consciousness, she, uh, God, I'm sorry. Um. I told myself I wasn't going to cry today. Um, uh, she knew what was going on because she's a nurse. She knew she was in a life or death situation, and she knew she wasn't going to die. God just gave her, like, overwhelming supernatural peace in that moment, and I'm thankful that he did. Let's turn to John 16. I don't know if I can talk about that anymore. Um, the point I was trying to make, though, is that, look, man, I wasn't peaceful. And my lack of peace didn't do anything to affect her situation. God had her. And it, it was not up to me. And I'm, I thank God it wasn't up to me. And that can be for, true for us, too. When we go through distress, that's where we go. We don't have to get there immediately. God will eventually grant us that peace. It's not always immediate. In John 16, 33, this is one, of, I call this my favorite uh, promise of Jesus. <laughs> uh, John 16, 33, I've said these things to you, and the things that he said to them is about the Spirit. It's about how God's going to send a comforter, about how they're going to walk uh, with God because of the Spirit that's coming. He said, I've said these things to you that in me you ha may have what? Peace. In the world you'll have what? Tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. So this promise that Jesus told his apostles and that applies to us is, is that in him, in Christ, we can have peace. That's in the context of in the world, we're going to have distress. We're going to have tribulation. We're going to have trouble. We're going to deal with things because the kingdom hasn't come yet. The world's not perfect yet. And so... Um, if you go through periods of time where you don't have peace, the exhortation is to go to God. Not that that's the staples like easy button. Like you just press it and it's like, boom, peace, I got it. Sometimes these things take time. So in the series, in the kingdom series, we've looked at six ways that the kingdom of God can be seen in its fullness in the future and in part now. We've looked at this idea of shalom today, how it's completeness, it's wholeness, it's peace. Um, it's so many things. And we don't have that complete fullness of that yet. We, we yearn for it. We'll experience that in the future kingdom of God. That's when we will have complete wholeness. The world will have complete wholeness. And uh, everything will have shalom. But in the meantime, the exhortation this morning is, we know theologically that God has repaired this breach between us and him through Christ. We know that in a Christian community, whether we come from a Jewish background or a Gentile background, it doesn't matter. We can experience family and peace in the confines of a Christian community. And when it comes to our internal battle for peace, the things that we deal with, uh, anxiety, tribulation, distress, whatever the case might be, 
that we go to God in those moments. We seek him in those moments, just like David did, and that he will give us that peace. But I just encourage you that in the moments when you're dealing with things, it's not always going to be immediate. So don't get down. Don't stop going to God because it doesn't happen the exact moment you finish your prayer. Continue investing in Him. Continue seeking Him. Continue pouring your heart out to Him and telling Him how you really feel. Look at Psalms. That's what David did. So as we consider and reflect upon all of that, just think about the wholeness that we have spiritually, the completeness that we have spiritually, how that anticipates the kingdom future that we have to look forward to, and how we can invite others into that completeness. Because people outside of the church, they don't have peace. They don't have wholeness. They don't have completeness. And they don't even know where to get it. And that is the exciting thing that we get to do, is we get to invite people into that are strangers and foreigners right now, as it says in Ephesians 2, we can invite them into the nation of God. We can invite them into the family of God, into that temple that Jesus is building. Let's pray. You unravel me with the melody. You surround me with a song. Compass, it's been a wonderful morning, um, and it doesn't have to be over just yet. We invite you to stick around for a 10-minute coffee party in the lobby. Grab another cup of coffee, have another conversation. It's just really good to be together. Um, if you've got kids, you can pick them up down in the gym near the double doors where you came in this morning. Um, thanks for being here with us. 
May the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times in every way. The Lord be with all of you. Thanks.